I hand over to Ajit Prakash Saigavi, officiating as the chairperson of AKF in the temporary absence of Ajit Sudarshan Satija, for his welcome address. Over to you, Prakash sir. Thank you, Ranga. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, Ajits, families of Ajits, and friends worldwide. Wishing you all a very happy new year. I take this opportunity on behalf of AKF to welcome Lieutenant General M. V. Suchendra Kumar, Vice Chief of Army Staff, Vice Admiral Krishna Swaminathan, Chief of Personal Navy, Rear Admiral T. V. N. Prasanna, Joint Secretary, Maritime Security, NSCS, Rear Admiral Ramakrishnan, Flag Officer Commanding Karnataka Naval Area, Vice Admiral M. A. M. P. Oli, retired, Major General Arjun Muthana, Major General Sridhar, Rear Admiral R. M. Purandare, Vice Admiral Shiva Kumar, Controller, Warship Production and Acquisition, Rear Admiral Venkatraman, Flag Officer Submarines, Mr. Swaminathan, CEO Energy Shipping, Commodore Arvind Shigao, Group Captain Pratipa Best, Principal Sanic School Bijapur, Lieutenant Colonel Deepu, Admin Officer Sanic School Amravati Nagar, Principals, Staff and Students of 33 Sanic Schools, namely Sanic School Amravati Nagar, Sanic School Ambikapur, Sanic School Amethi, Sanic School Balachadi, Sanic School Bhubaneswar, Sanic School Bijapur, Sanic School Chandrapur, Sanic School Chingchip, Sanic School Chittorgar, Sanic School East Siang, Sanic School Gorakal, Sanic School Golpara, Sanic School Gopal Ganj, Sanic School Infal, Sanic School Kalikiri, Sanic School Jhansi, Sanic School Junjuno, Sanic School Kapurthala, Sanic School Kazakutam, Sanic School Kodagu, Sanic School Kurukonda, Sanic School Kunjipura, Sanic School Mainpuri, Sanic School Nagrocha, Sanic School Nagalanda, Sanic School Punglwa, Sanic School Purulia, Sanic School Reva, Sanic School Revari, Sanic School Sambalpur, Sanic School Satara, Sanic School Sujan Purtira, Sanic School Tilaya, Sanic School Rangoli, Sangoli Rayana, Kittur Rani Chanama Residential School, the June Business School, Annapurna Institute of Management Research, Nippani University of Waikato, Kaili College, Chikodi, Jolly Group of Institutions, VSM College of Engineering, Nippani, Kendriya Vidyalayas of the Naval Sector, Navy Children's Schools, to this evening session of Ajit Knowledge Forum. I also welcome the audience from the corporate field. Ajit Knowledge Forum, fondly called AKF, is one of the verticals of the Ajit Alumni Association, an association of passouts of Sanis School Vijaypura, erstwhile Vijapur. This forum is a platform that facilitates the association's vision for Ajits to lead a purposeful and fulfilling life and to achieve its mission of promoting the spirit of camaraderie, compassion, and cooperation so as to stimulate their individual and collective interest in service of fellow Ajits or alma mater and our society. Started since August 21, AKF has been conducting online talk programs, chat sessions related to various fields of entrepreneurship, science and technology, health, information technology, films, space, spirituality, defense, etc. with the likes of Captain G.R. Gopinath and Ajit himself, Sri Subroto Bhatti, Dr. Devi Shetty, Mr. Sham Benigal, Wing Commander Rakesh Sharma, Dr. Mashelkar, Dr. Lalit Kanodia, late Pooja Siddheshwar Swamiji, Lieutenant General Syed Atta Hasnain, and Mr. Julio Francis Ribeiro. It's my pleasure to welcome our creative mentors who have been the guiding lights and motivators have been, who have been showing us the path of giving back to the alma mater and society. Colonel BGV Kumar, our first school captain, Gopal Vasur, IPS, IGP retired, president of our AAA, Dr. Ashok Dalwai, IAS, CEO of the National Rainford Area Authority, Chairperson Committee for Doubling of Farmers Income, Department of Agriculture, and also the member of the Technical Advisory Committee at DMEO, Niti Ayog, Government of India, Shashidar Albur, the advisor of the AKF, and Sudarshan Satija, Chairman of AKF, and many, many more Ajits. It has been our dream to have a conglomerate encompassing all Sanic schools in the country on a platform to try and deliver the best for the alumni and the cadets at these schools and society. The dream has turned out fructus. Today's session 
shall be a conversational address, one with a very eminent, nationally acclaimed navigation specialist, a man known for his strategic planning and leadership, professional integrity with a humane approach to maritime security and always putting nation before self. I am fortunate and opportuned to welcome Vice Admiral G. Ashok Kumar, ABSM, PBSM, VSM, ADC for the day's session. Welcome, sir. I again extend my warm welcome to you all this evening. Thank you. Back to you, Ranga. Thank you, Sai Gavi, sir. I now invite Commodore Dr. Srikant B. Kesnur to introduce the speaker for this session, Vice Admiral G. Ashok Kumar. Over to you, Commodore Kesnur. Thank you, Ranga. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. As India celebrates the 75th year of being a republic, we have much to celebrate. From being an impoverished nation, we have become a global powerhouse in 75 years. However, as we step into the Amrit Kal, we have new frontiers to conquer. One of those frontiers is that of the seas and oceans. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the seas and oceans around us have several dimensions. Historically, India has an ancient relationship with them. The oldest tidal dock in the world is in Lothal near Ahmedabad. Our ancestors were great seafarers. That is one reason India was amongst the richest countries in the world till the end of the first millennium. They sailed far and wide uh, from we had maritime connections from Rome and Greece in the West to Japan, Korea, and China in the East. Geographically, India is in the center of the Indian Ocean, the smallest but busiest of all the oceans. Now comes to economics. Ladies and gentlemen, more than 90% of trade is carried on the ocean. Therefore, our economic well-being is dependent on them. Our exclusive economic zone alone is 2.1 million square kilometers, which is about two thirds of our land area. Coming to social aspects, the seas and oceans are global commons, which means they can be used by everyone. You can consider the seas and oceans as the first version of internet and seafarers as the first global community or the first Facebook so to say. But it is in the realm of security that seas and oceans provide both opportunities and challenges. We saw how the Indian Navy has performed both in that 1971 war, in recent operations, and going as far back as 1961 liberation of Goa. But the challenges have also manifested them, themselves uh, through the landing of RDX on the West Coast, which resulted in the bomb blast in 1993 and more recently in 2008 terror attacks. Now, one reason for this was that there were host of agencies, host of players in the maritime media. The government of India therefore decided that we need a controller, a coordinator, a headmaster of sorts who can harmonize the activities of all these players on the seas and oceans concerning our maritime security and national prosperity. It is in that connection that we had one person who was appointed as the National Maritime Security Coordinator, the first National Maritime Security Coordinator, who is our distinguished guest speaker today. Ladies and gentlemen, Vice Admiral Ashok Kumar has had a distinguished career, and it would take long for me to give out all the details of his illustrious career. So I will barely give some skeletal details today. He is an alumnus of Sainik School Amaravati Naga, uh, joining in 71 and passing out in 78. He was from the Chera house and in school he excelled in swimming, boxing, gymnastics, apart from academics. Interestingly, he was also a member of the school band, which won acclaim uh, for its performances all over. He joined NDA in the 60th course Charlie Scorden and passed out from there in 1982. Uh, 
he was commissioned uh, sorry he was commissioned in 1982 uh, july 1982 thereafter he pursued a career in navigation and operation which is basically uh, the central aspect of uh, the navy uh, he was the navigating officer of many ships including the earlier ins vikrant our aircraft carrier it was as he went up in his career he did a host of things including prestigious courses as well as one abroad expeditionary warfare course in quantico usa ladies and gentlemen he has had the distinction of commanding two frontline ships a missile corvette ins kulish and a missile guided missile destroyer ins ranvi of which he was earlier the navigating officer too now as he went senior in his rank he could do a variety of assignments that helped him gain 360 degrees exposure and contribute to the navy in operations he was the head of the operations vertical of the western naval command as a commodore he was responsible for the security of maharashtra and gujarat area as a rear admiral in training he was the head of naval training at dssc wellington he was a flag officer sea training as a rear admiral and as a vice admiral he was the commandant of the national defense secretary in diplomacy he was our defense attache in singapore a prestigious post for more than 3 years but above all ladies and gentlemen it was as the deputy chief of naval staff and vice chief of naval staff from 2016 to 2021 that he was able to leave his maximum imprint on the navy uh it was in these roles responsible for operations and plans of the navy shepherding the navy in senior echelons through galwan and covid that he was responsible for not just acquisitions but also for several naval plans for flagging of the navy's innovation and indigenization for mission based deployment and a host of other activities therefore it was in the fitness of things that after he retired the government appointed him considering his vast experience as a first national maritime security coordinator you may also be delighted to know ladies and gentlemen that the admiral is a true scholar warrior he is pursuing his phd in the naval war college and is a phd scholar studying maritime issues uh, so with that very brief introduction may i now request the admiral Uh, to deliver his address thank you let me just share my screen then after i can start can you see it shrikan yes sir yes yeah thank you Uh, okay thank you uh, for the kind uh, introduction shrikant i must uh, let you all know that uh, one of the uh, secrets that uh, kesnur held behind was that he is my phd guide so so much for that now uh, the other thing that is that the when i got the first call from shrikant to say that uh, could i address the ajit knowledge forum uh, i did not uh, understand the mammothness of this event you know i am truly impressed by the way that you all have gone about it i must compliment uh, the ex students of bijapur boy for having conceptualized such a forum and set it up and the list of uh, uh, luminaries who have addressed uh, this gathering is uh, truly you know inspiring to say the least <clears throat> okay now uh, the topic given to be just hang on a minute there you go okay so the topic given to me is securing uh, safeguarding india's maritime frontiers uh, challenges and strategies so uh, i've been given about 40 to 45 minutes uh, and i'll try and do just to do that but i must put in a caveat here uh, maritime security is a vast subject i mean as vast as the oceans themselves so uh, it might not be possible for me to cover the entire uh, you know gamut of what happens uh, under the uh, ambit of maritime security but i'll be happy to take on any questions that uh, any of you have at the end of what i have to say okay 
This is how I intend covering it, uh, peculiarly in the IOR, the maritime character, complications of the seas, because it's quite complicated. It's a very unlike land. Uh, maritime threats, challenges, and what are the repercussions of failure uh, to ensure maritime security? Let me touch upon peculiarities of the IOR. Now, as you all are aware, the Indian Ocean is the only ocean named after a country. And not only that, Indian Ocean, unlike the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans, is a closed ocean from the top. As a result, entry into or exit out of the Indian Ocean is through choke points. I have put in the choke points on the slide, as you can see. On the west uh, of India, you've got the Cape of Good Hope, well to the south, the Mozambique Channel, the Gulf of Aden, which leads to Babel Mandeb and up to Suez Canal. You've got the Strait of Hormuz, which leads into Persian Gulf. And on to our east, you've got the Straits of Malacca, uh, the way uh, world famous and probably the busiest in the world. The Sunda Strait, which is between Sumatra and Java in Indonesia. The Lombok Strait further east of Sunda and the Ombai Vetar Strait further east of Lombok. So these few uh, choke points are the ones which provide entry into and exit out of the Indian Ocean region. Now, let me uh, add some more details. The economic importance of these vital choke points you know, is because over 60% of our world's oil shipments go through the international shipping lanes of the Indian Ocean region. One third of world's bulk cargo, 70% of world's container traffic, all of that go through these ISRs, uh, ISLs. And one peculiarity of this is this, that three-fourths of the trade uh, that happens through the interact shipping lanes here is external to the ISR. Therefore, uh, the choke points are such uh, so important. Now, let me touch upon our maritime character. If you look at India, you know, it juts out nearly 1,000 nautical miles into the sea from the coastline above. And the length of the coastline, you would have uh, read and seen at a lot of places, it is mentioned at 7,500 or thereabouts. Uh, in fact, more scientific ways of measuring it have now revealed that the length of the coastline is 11,084 kilometers. It is soon to be promulgated. The final steps are now being taken. Uh, there was also an endeavor undertaken to exactly count the number of islands uh, that the country has. And the number that has arrived at is 1389, uh, which is mainly in two clusters, Lakshadweep and Minikoi to our west, uh, which is circled in blue on the, on the slide, and the Andamans and Nicobars, which is further to the east. Now, what are our maritime interests? What is it that we need to protect? Uh, Srikant brought out the fact that 95% of our trade is through the seas. If you look at globally, you know, if you if you went through the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development Annual Report, 80% of global trade is maritime in nature. So there is this inextricable link between maritime security and uh, national GDPs, and especially so of India, which has got 95% of our trade through the seas. 80% of our energy sources come through the seas as well. It's either through imports or through offshore development areas. So for oil and natural gas, we are totally dependent upon maritime security. As I said, offshore oil production, uh, Kestu mentioned about 2.1 million square kilometers of EEZ that we have. This is the area from which all the resources, whether living or dead, uh, is for us to exploit. And 61% of our domestic production, petroleum production, is from these oil, offshore oil fields, which are mainly Mumbai High and the uh, Krishna Godavari Basin to the east. Now, so I just want to put this out. We take a lot of things for granted. You know, when you go to a petrol pump, I particularly put the slide up for you to understand. And suppose you find this uh, notice put up there. Fuel is uh, unavailable at the moment. And this lasts for, say, three days. Imagine if it were to last for three months or say three years, you know, you can imagine what happens to normal life uh, and the society in general. So that's the effect, you know, lack of maritime security can put up. Fisheries is another huge uh, area of maritime interest for the nation. It is mainly also because 1.7% of our GDP is contributed by the fishing, fishing sector. And our exports has kind of been growing at such a rapid pace, about 64,000 crores of annual exports uh, is from our country. Now, you also see that market-wise export, 
you know, the, the kind of value that is there. This 43,000 is of 2021. And as I mentioned, there's been galloping. It is now 64,000. And I've just briefly put across what kind of exports of fisheries happens to various countries. 12 major ports and about 230-odd, I've said about 200 non-major ports. It's actually well over 200. It's about 239 uh, non-major ports. The difference is that major ports are controlled by the center, which is uh, uh, which is uh, uh, under the central government, and the uh, 200 non-major ports uh, is controlled by the states. And these ports are economic gateways of the country. Because if 95% of our trade through the, is through the ports, you, you'll realize that how these are actually the economic gateways of the country. I've just put out statistics. All that would uh, need to interest you is that 474.96 million metric tons of cargo is handled in our ports. And each of these ports, I've also just put out as to what do they mainly handle. I mean, this is just for information for you. International shipping lanes, you know, and these are the ones which take ships from ports to the choke points and to their final destinations. Uh, and as I mentioned, more than uh, nearly 70% is actually external. So all of them lead from ports to the choke points in the Indian Ocean region and beyond. And these are truly our economic lifelines. And these lines that you see and the, and the color coding that you see is because of the number of ships which are there. Per annum, in a year, the Indian Ocean international shipping lanes see about 1,30,000 ships. And you now have the IMAC, which puts out uh, Information Management and Analysis Center of the Navy, which puts out a monthly maritime security update. And as per that, every month, at any given day, the average number of ships in the Indian Ocean region is about 30,000. Okay. The other thing is this, our crude oil imports. You know, I mentioned as to how vast majority of our uh, energy requirements are actually imported from abroad. And this is just the percentage uh, of, of our energy imports. The other uh, one that I want to put across here is our diaspora. If you see, we've got about 2.29% of our population living abroad. And uh, 1.49 actually within the IOR region itself. And why is this so important in the maritime interest to us? Because every time there is a problem, like we faced during COVID, if there is a requirement for our Indians to come back to the country, or if there is a political instability in some certain countries and our Indians have to be evacuated, that becomes a maritime uh, interest as well. And this, this diaspora, there is also 87 billion USD of uh, uh, contribution that comes into our GDP, which uh, which comes to about 2.7 percent of the GDP. One more uh, information for you all: the International Seabed Authority allocates areas for polymetallic nodules and polymetallic sulfides uh, exploration for various countries, and these are the two areas uh, which are which are far away. I mean, you'll see the distances I mentioned there. The, the southern one is 4,000 kilometers away from us. And these need to be these areas need to be protected as well because they belong to us for uh, exploration for polymetallic no uh, nodules and sulfides. The other less known fact is the is this that ninety nine percent of communication global communication is through submarine cables which goes through the seas, and all your financial transactions and and so many other things your internet, uh, all of them uh, depend on the safety and security of this underwater uh, cables, which carry 98%. Now, I want to briefly touch upon the complications of the maritime domain. This, again, is very less understood uh, by, by people who are not uh, dealing with the maritime domain. Uh, if you see, we've got the concept of global commerce. What does that mean? It just means that anybody is allowed to be anywhere in the sea. It does not matter which nation you belong to, which nation you're coming from, and which nation you're headed to. The United Nations uh, Convention of the Loss of Seas that came out in 1982 uh, gave away certain areas to nations for exploiting. 12 nautical miles, which is roughly about 23 kilometers, is the territorial waters from any country. 
contiguous zone is about 24 nautical miles where your customs and financial uh, rules apply. Exclusive economic zone goes up to 200 nautical miles. Despite all this, what is territorial waters? Your sovereignty applies. Your, your, all your uh, law applies in these waters, but not in the rest of them. And even in territorial waters, anybody can pass through, which is called the innocent passage. Anyone can take passage through those waters. When it comes to the rest of it, anybody can be anywhere. That kind of complicates it. Now, to, to explain this, if you were to leave on a ship from, say, Mumbai Harbor or Cochin or New Mangalore, uh, what happens is that within about half an hour or 45 minutes, you would have crossed the territorial waters. And it is highly possible you will run into warships of any nation uh, from, from across the world. And they are legally allowed to be there. So it is not illegal to be there. So this is one complication that one needs to realize. Now, in all this, why should we be worried? The primary job of any Navy or any maritime force really uh, is to win a maritime war when deterrence fails. In fact, the primary job is deterrence. You know, you be as strong as possible so that nobody uh, dares to come to fight with you. But in case that fails, we have to win the next maritime battle. However, the bigger threat and, and the more common threat is the 24-7 circumventional threat. I'll, I'll brief about it subsequently. Now, so navies, as I said, ensure peace by being fully prepared for war. And these are some pictures that I put out as to how they fully prepare. Uh, which, which is a you know day-to-day -day thing for the navies. When it comes to 24-7 conventional threats, I mean this is something that is present 24-7, 365 days out there at sea. First one is piracy. I'm sure you all have heard of Gulf of Aden and as to how pirates are playing havoc. Quite often you're you're kind of questioned as to why should the Indian Navy be bothered about Gulf of Aden, which is say 1,500 nautical miles away simply because more than $130 billion of our annual trade comes through the Gulf of Aden. So we cannot sit and you know, uh, watch pirates you know, make hay. Now, so because of that, in the Gulf of Aden, the Indian Navy has deployed a warship since October of 2008, continuously present there, being replaced by another ship if one ship has to come back. And this has led... Uh, to a lot of escorts. Currently, it is not an escort operation which is undertaken. Its very presence actually prevents pirates from acting upon it. Now, the Indian Navy and Coast Guard combined in 2010 launched one of the most successful piracy operations ever undertaken, I think, across the world anyway. Uh, what happened was that the pirates from the Gulf of Aden had moved well east. And in fact, four of the pirates were actually arrested from one of the beaches in the Lakshmi Islands. So that is when the seriousness uh, had to be addressed and off island was launched and the Navy and the Coast Guard ended up arresting 119 pirates and they were in the jails uh, in, in uh, Mumbai before they were kind of handed over back to the elders in Somalia for them to be tried. Important hormones, you know, two-third of India's oil, as you all are aware, uh, comes through, these, uh, through the strait and half of India's natural gas comes from there. So as a result, if there's any threat or instability in that region, it bothers us. And what happened? The Indian Navy launched something called the Ops Sankal. And this was launched in early 2019. This is to ensure safe passage of trade coming to India. And Indian flagged ships, even if they're not carrying, carrying trade to India, to pass safely this side and that side of Strait of Hormuz. And they've been escorted by special forces for quite some time. Now that has stopped. But as and when, it's like a sinusoidal curve when it goes up and comes down, this escort will continue. The other big threat that uh, Kestool also spoke about is maritime terrorism. 2611, as you all uh, uh, remember, uh, happened in 2008 when Ajmal Kasab and his group of personnel uh, came in through the sea route, you know, through a boat, you know, captured an Indian fishing boat, got into that, uh, chopped the heads of the crew, and then came into Mumbai and did what they did. And this actually create, was truly the birth of coastal security. And what happened? Uh, there are a number of actions which were taken. One of them was to set up coastal radar uh, network all along our coast, whether it was mainland or on, on both sides of the island. We also created something called the IMAC, 
Information Management and Analysis Center, the picture that you see in your uh, right bottom corner of this uh, of the slide. So this is the Guru Ground, which collates all the pictures. In addition to the radar network, we also have a national AIS chain. We've got ships and aircrafts deployed uh, regularly, in fact, on a daily basis, and they all contribute the picture as well. There is a space-based, satellite-based, uh, global AIS picture which comes in. There's something called the long-range uh, information and tracking from all the merchant ships which are there out at sea. All of them are collated. And if you look at the screen, uh, the bottom right picture, uh, next to India, you find those white dots. These are all ships that are flying along the uh, ISLs. The other thing that happened was a, a three-layered coastal security concept, uh, which had the Navy in the outer uh, layer, Coast Guard closer to the coast, and Marine Police much closer to the coast, and trying maritime legal issues, uh, you know, staying on the coast. And maritime terrorism also opened our eyes towards offshore security and defense. And so there are a number of assets today which are regularly deployed to ensure uh, offshore security. In fact, uh, Admiral Purandre, who's here, uh, he was the flag officer offshore defense advisory group whose responsibility it was to ensure uh, security of offshore assets like this. That running is the other threat. I mean, and, uh, that happens, uh, you know, uh, in plenty in our waters. And this uses the legal loopholes that are present because you cannot carry guns. If you're not in federal waters or somebody, if you catch somebody with, with arms and ammunition, that's perfectly legal to be there. So they exploit that. And all this and the next slide, which is drugs, end up also supporting terrorism. As you're aware, uh, drug flows from uh, from somewhere on the Makaran coast uh, along likely patrolled areas of, of the uh, Omani coast beyond their total waters and then comes down to uh, the east coast of Africa, which uh, funds terrorist groups like Al-Shabaab and, and so on and so forth. The other threat is environmental degradation because of which, uh, you know, cyclones, uh, the numbers and the severity have only gone up. Uh, I've just put in some examples, whether it was Kerala floods of 2018, whether it was cyclone of Oki uh, of Kerala and the Lakshadweep Islands, which was devastated uh, by Oki. Uh, there was a cyclone which hit Socotra, and uh, our, I think, 32 or 38 uh, fishermen, uh, their boats uh, capsized and were stuck in uh, Socotra. They were brought back uh, to India by the Navy. And uh, Cyclone Mora, uh, in Bangladesh. So, in all these instances, uh, Mozambique, Cyclone Aidai, and there are a number of examples that I can give you. Uh, Indian Navy has, by and large, been the first responder uh, entering into the country, literally following the uh, in the wake of the cyclone to provide uh, relief for these people. Now, the other role that the navies have is a diplomatic role. Now, this is very important because navies are best suited for this role. As I mentioned, if you want, once you leave a harbor, you are into international waters in no time. And therefore, uh, you're the best suited. And you are operating global commerce. And sustenance of personality. You can remain off a country, staying beyond, say, territorial waters, 12 nautical miles, and you can remain there forever if supported by a tanker to give you adequate fuel. Uh, so sustenance and versatility. Versatility because every naval ship not only can you know fire a missile, but can also provide HADR. You know, so the versatility extends uh, through a wide range of operations. A few things that I would like to mention here. One of the Honorable Prime Minister's vision of saga, security and growth for all in the region. Now, why security and growth for all in the region? Basically because it is a clear realization that non-traditional threats to maritime security are transnational in nature. So if it is a cyclone, it could hit where Maldives, Sri Lanka, and India at all at the same time. Similarly, it's a drug riddling case. By a minor alteration of course, you could come land either in Maldives or in Sri Lanka or in India. Uh, and, and so on and so forth. So there are many examples that I can give. But so, Prime Minister announced this uh, vision in 2015 uh, and security and growth for all in the region. And the Prime Minister also chaired a uh, United Nations Security Council open discussion on maritime security, a case for international cooperation. So these are there are a number of uh, facts that came out of this too, and this vision of Sagar is the one in which Indian Navy and the Coast Guard base their uh, foreign uh, cooperation entities, and there are a number of them. Uh, for instance, the Indian Navy launched something called the IONS, Indian Ocean Naval Symposium. It's an Indian Naval Initiative of 2008, 
and currently we have 25 members and eight observers. Eight observers who are external to Indian Ocean, uh, including China, is a member of uh, IRON. And uh, uh, in addition to that, we also carry, I just wanted to mention that the, the right uh, hand picture is the 10th anniversary of ION, which happened in 2018 uh, at, at Cochin, where all the, all the members and observers were present. The other thing that the Indian Navy does is the joint, and the Coast Guard actually does, is the joint ease and patrol with a number of countries uh, in our region. Uh, as I mentioned, not everybody has the capability and the capacity to patrol the vast ease that they, that they have. So as a result, uh, the Indian Navy provides uh, help to them to uh, ensure that non-traditional threats to maritime security do not uh, bother them. Coordinated patrols. Uh, with the countries that we share uh, uh, an international maritime boundary with, we carry, uh, carry out corpats or coordinated patrols. Um, this is basically to enhance mutual confidence. We do it with Bangladesh, with Myanmar, with Thailand, and with Indonesia, all in the Bay of Bengal. We have also launched an information fusion center. Uh, now, the, the picture that you see on the right uh, of the slide is the IMAC, which I had showed you earlier as well. But with this, there is also an IFC IOR, Information Fusion Center, Indian Ocean Region. Now, the, what this does is to collate a maritime domain as awareness picture, because this is quite often the first step towards ensuring maritime security. And for which, as I said, uh, you know, it's it's not possible for you to do it all alone. So this is just getting together with all countries which are in the region, get their picture as well, and put up uh, what is called the consolidated maritime domain awareness picture. And this picture is shared with all our partners as well. And this place has also got international liaison officers. Start, you know, whether it is US, France, Singapore, Japan, and our immediate uh, maritime neighbors, all of them are represented in the IFC IOR. Uh, there are numerous multilateral and bilateral exercises that, that we do, uh, which enhances mutual understanding and promotes interoperability. And this is very regular. In fact, last year in 22 alone, I think something like 60 bilateral exercises and 12 multilateral exercises we did with various ones. You are, uh, Obviously, you're aware of Malabar that we do with the four quad countries. And in addition to that, we did the first ever India ASEAN uh, maritime bilateral uh, mar maritime exercise. We have a trilateral with Singapore and Thailand. We did a trilateral with Aus Australia and Indonesia. Uh, uh, so there are a number of uh, bilateral and multilateral maritime exercises that we do. Okay. Now, so now let me let me start. Uh, I think I'm already at six forty two. So let me start telling you what what are the challenges which are faced. Now, the challenges that we face are, first is the multi-agency nature of maritime security. Uh, again, uh, Commodore Kesno touched upon this. Uh, if you actually look at it, the number of ministries which are involved in, in, in the center uh, is huge because you've got the MOD, which itself is now split up into uh, DMA and DOD. The Navy under the DMA, the Coast Guard under the DOD. You got the Marine Police, which is a state subject, and you got coastal security being actually addressed by the Ministry of Home Affairs because, uh, based on one of the recommendations post Cargill, uh, there was a Department of uh, uh, Border Management which was created in the Ministry of Home Affairs, which is responsible for coastal security, and then you've got BSF, which has got a water wing uh, where we've got international uh, boundary lines. Uh, with, with Pakistan on the west and with Bangladesh in the east, the BSF has a water wing. We've got customs, uh, which has got a marine wing. Uh, we've got the Narcotics Control Bureau. We've got the Department of Revenue Intelligence. You know, We've got port security. And for port security, you've got the CISF, which looks after major ports. You've got uh, the SISF, which looks after minor ports and states. And where SISF is not there, uh, it is private security. Which is, so... The, the number of agencies which look after maritime security is huge. If you look at offshore security, for example, there is a responsibility for the operator. There is a, re a responsibility for the Coast Guard, which is responsible for offshore security. And there's a responsibility for the Navy, which is responsible for offshore defense, if there's a, say, a terrorist threat. So this is one major challenge that we have. And now with the creation of Na National Maritime Security Coordinator, 
What I have done is to create a multi lab agency structure called the MAMSG, Multi Agency Maritime Security Group. You know, when the National Maritime Security Coordinator got created, uh, I recall in the initial comments, the police officer was telling me as to how we dealt with coastal security for some time. He'll be happy to know that now we have one state maritime security coordinator in each of the coastal states and unit. And he's called the, uh, you know, SMSE. So not only is he in the police organization of the state, but also reports to the National Maritime Security Coordinator in, in, uh, in the subject of maritime security. So in the MAMSG, which was created, Multi-Agency Maritime Security Group, in that is a, uh, once in a, there is a MAMSG policy, which meets once every quarter, in which all the central ministries and all the state maritime security coordinators of the nine coastal states and four coastal union territories, 13 of them total, uh, attend. Uh, we also have other structures to enhance multi-agency coordination. So this is one huge step that the government took and I think it is paying its uh, dividends. Vastness of the seas, as I told you, is, a, is the uh, other challenge uh, that can be there because you cannot calculate, you know, area of the sea into the number of units that you require to patrol them. It, that's not possible. So it has got to be prioritized. It has got to be, you know, analyzed as to where the threat is, where the... So uh, vastness of the seas can be a massive challenge. Politically uncontrolled areas. This I have uh, mentioned in the global commons concept that seas are politically uncontrolled. You know, you could have EZ from where you can actually get uh, the uh, resources, but that does not mean it kind of belongs to you. So that is one thing that we've got to be careful. The next C is a crowded space. I told you about any given time, 30,000 ships, and these are actually about 300 tons. There are a number of them which are below 300 tons. Fishing boats. India alone has nearly 3 lakh fishing boats which are registered, which go out to sea. So when you, from say in the middle of Arabian Sea or Bay of Bengal, if you start moving towards uh, the Indian coastline, you will find the crowd of contacts which are there out at sea on the rise. And closer to the coast, it's phenomenally high. So ensuring coastal security can that much, uh, can be a huge challenge. Rules versus freedom of navigation. Because quite often there are certain rules which are made, you know, do this, don't, don't do this. UNCLOS uh, has certain rules as well. But the unfortunate part is that that has got to keep in mind the concept of freedom of navigation. Again, born out of the you know, concept of uh, global commons. So, uh, you know, there are a lot of things which you think, you know, this guy can actually take advantage of uh, in creating a problem for you, but yet that concept of freedom of navigation that he enjoys uh, can always challenge uh, your security. Politics, I've just left it in there because as I mentioned, because we have the global commons ensuring, trying to ensure maritime security and because we are all in it together, uh, the, the concept of Sagar, security and growth for all in the region. Uh, so local politics or change of regimes in some other uh, countries could also impact upon your own ability to ensure that uh, you know you all probably are uh, as aware as I am of what's happening between uh, Maldives and us. So this is this can be a challenge. Okay, uh, but yet uh, you know uh, uh, it is ever, we are kind of ever ready uh, for the call of duty. I just give these few examples: Samudra Setu uh, and Sagar and Samudra Setu too. These are all during the uh, COVID times. Uh, as to how uh, I mentioned about Indian diaspora wanting to come back. So uh, they were kind of brought back or uh, taken uh, to in, brought back to India. Uh, and also our help in providing medicines and, uh, and uh, rations and things like that to various uh, countries around in the Indian Ocean region was huge. And it was a huge challenge. Okay. Now, how does the Indian Navy uh, do all this is through the concept of mission-based deployments, which started on the 1st of July, 2017. Uh, since then, the uh, Navy has gone into a concept of mission-based deployments. And there are these identified places uh, across the Indian Ocean region where uh, the Navy almost continuously uh, deploys its uh, warships. Some places where it's continuous, like for example, Gulf of Aden, I mentioned to you, since October of 2008, we have been there. Uh, of Santal that I told you in the state of Hormuz, 
the Navy continues to be there. And as situation keeps changing, uh, you know, there'll be more and more ships. Currently, the ongoing issue between, uh, of, you know, issue that the shipping faces in the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden uh, because of uh, Houthis and the, and the uh, attacks on them. You know, there are the number of uh, ships which are deployed there obviously has gone up. Uh, we also on the east have a Malacca deployment or the Maldep, it's called, which is near, uh, continuous, uh, and and so on. Uh, you can see on the chart uh, that uh, the mission-based deployments has really helped uh, us on a number of uh, measures. One is to, to to ensure your presence. That actually helps you in collating a maritime domain awareness picture of the region. Second, to respond as quickly as possible to any developing situation and also to undertake foreign uh, cooperation endeavors. Now, so in case I, I mentioned about the importance of maritime security, uh, now what happens if maritime security is threatened on a single day, uh, as just been shown here in one small slide. If you look at Strait of Hormuz, you know, if there is a maritime security incident which prevents your uh, ships from coming in and uh, going back, 423 million US dollars per day will be the loss that the country will have. Uh, this this uh, figure that has been put down at the bottom of 1.3 billion uh, USD per day, obviously if uh, there's no maritime security anywhere around, that might be too much to uh, kind of expect. But yet, uh, if you look at, say, for example, to the east, uh, Sunda, Lombok, and uh, Malacca, you know, it's 517 million USD per day uh, is the kind of trade that uh, comes through there. So, uh, so there are a number of adverse effects on balance of payments, you know, uh, and a whole lot of things. I mean, you can see on the bottom corner of the slide and inflation, loss of jobs, shortage of raw materials, commodities. So the economy will essentially will come to a grinding halt if maritime security is not sure. So this is my final slide. All that I would like to say is maritime security is equal to national prosperity. And if that's not ensured, uh, any country can be can come down to its knees. Okay. Okay, with that, I'll stop. I think I've taken about 40 minutes uh, and I'm happy to take on any questions that you have. Thank you, Admiral Ashok, for sharing your thoughts on the challenges and strategies on safeguarding India's maritime frontiers. I'm sure your talk has given a lot of food for thought to the audience and they have a deeper appreciation of the subject. I now hand over the floor to Ajit Commodore Srikant Kesnur for a Q&A session. Over to you, Srikant Kesnur. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Admiral. Uh, I think uh, the challenge of trying to talk about the maritime domain is that it is both vast and deep. And, and there is only so much time in which we can fit in everything. I think you did a wonderful job at, and the slides illustrated everything so well. I think people will register that immediately. Uh, so thanks a lot, sir. Uh, questions have been flowing uh, thick and uh, fast and furious. So so uh, would you, uh, if, if you're okay, I'll just uh, take one odd question and add something else that has come out of this one so that uh, sir, there is one question, and you also mentioned that about uh, the, the coastal security, th the state police, and how that has been strengthened. So one of the questions uh, asked by uh, an anonymous attendee is relating to uh, the coastal police, as he calls it, or the marine police, uh, and, and in terms of how we can sort of strengthen it, uh, it is responsible for last mile security, so to say. Uh, so so uh, while the Navy and Coast Guard is well structured, uh, what can be done or must be done to strengthen the Marine Police so that the triad of maritime security can be uh, formidable? Uh, that's the question. Uh, okay, I think it's a, it's a, whoever has asked this question, I think it's a, an extremely important and timely question. Uh, basically, because, see, in 2008, when 2611 happened, uh, you know, the whole concept of coastal security kind of underwent a, a relook. And the uh, the orders that we passed were that the Indian Navy would be overall uh, responsible for overall maritime security, including coastal and offshore security. And the Coast Guard uh, was to be responsible for 
postal security in territorial waters. You know, so, uh, and the Marine Police, which came into being in 2005, before uh, the uh, 2611 incident happened, of course, it was only in the process of being you know, set up at that point in time, uh, you know, was suddenly, uh, you know, uh, there, was, there was a thought on what exactly should be its role. You know, uh, because if Tetol Waters is being taken care of by, uh, by the Coast Guard. Now, the reason, the rationale behind the Postal Police having come into being was that was coastal security closer to coast, where the Coast Guard did not have suitable, uh, you know, shallow uh, draft vessels for them to uh, patrol shallow waters, was the reason for by which boats were given to the police, 5-ton and 12-ton uh, ton boats, and they were to patrol that. But it can be a challenge. If you do not have a mari maritime orientation, and if, we, if you're only creating a maritime police, which is on a deputation for about a couple of years and then back to normal policing, you know, uh, manning and operating the boats can be a challenge. So let me assure you, this is an issue which is now being looked at de novo. And whether uh, from the coast, it should just be the Coast Guard's job uh, of uh, patrolling, and whether the Marine Police will stay ashore look after areas of dominant maritime activity, such as the ports, the fishing harbors, the fishing villages, you know, which go uh, the, uh, the entire coastline, uh, and you know, uh, dealing with uh, uh, information that kind of gather intelligence, so to speak. And uh, also to follow up on cases which the Coast Guard, because Coast Guard is the only force which is legally empowered as well, which kind of files it uh, in, the, in the police stations of the coastal police. So this is the model which is now being looked at uh, pretty seriously because as you will kind of appreciate, it is not easy to get into a, you know, a small boat and you know, sail from the coast uh, five nautical miles into the sea. Uh, right, sir. Thank you. So so uh, I, I guess you're saying that it will be examined de novo for all its dimensions and ramifications and we may see certain new structures happening or the old ones being firmed up. Uh, so there's one now going from the coast to the international sphere. Uh, I'm combining two questions here. There's one question by uh, Bharati Chitnavis. Uh, she's a law student. She asks if uh, UNCLOS itself has become uh, outdated and should should we sort of seek a new uh, uh, United Nations Convention for cause of the sea? Uh, she didn't know how much time it took for the old one to be ratified. Uh, and there's another one interesting which says the USA itself has not uh, ratified it. Uh, so, so uh, uh, how 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 do we uh, really think UNCLOS is therefore effective? So, so a few words on UNCLOS, if you can. And so, so UNCLOS, uh, you know, when it came to being in 1982, you know, this was the third United Nations Conference on Trade and uh, sorry on uh, uh, loss of the sea that led to the United Nations Convention uh, on the Loss of the Sea in 1982. So there was trouble in, in getting everybody to even agree to accept it. Uh, so because this was seen as, uh, is it kind of violating the uh, freedom of navigation or, or, the, or the concept of global commons? That was the concern. Uh, so, uh, however, what was accepted was that, you know, what was three nautical miles earlier as Tetol Waters Country had already adopted because the cannon shell's range was three nautical miles, was extended to 12 nautical miles that became Tetol Waters and, and, and so on and so forth. You know the rest of the UNCLOS. Uh, but when the UNCLOS was put up for ratification, countries were even free uh, to, uh, to put in any conditions that they wanted to do. And uh, India, along with uh, many others, actually put in a condition to say that we understand, uh, it, was, it was not, uh, we wanted this, but we said that we understand by the UNCLOS that there'll be no military maneuvers in the EZ without our concurrence. You know? So that is being objected to by a number of them, that's being uh, uh, accepted by a number of them. So the, the larger point that I'm trying to make is that uh, in that era to get a multilateral UNCLOS uh, going, uh, was a challenge and could be done. Now, in the, in the current uh, world, whether a new UNCLOS can actually be worked out is, is a good question. There are there are a number of uh, things that are happening. One is there is an UNCLOS group of friends. You know, some 160 countries are uh, 
uh, actually members of the Central of School of Friends, they keep discussing on how can we improve. And if, if not, you know, make a new UNCLOS completely, at least uh, are there clauses that can be addressed to make it better. About United Nations and UNCLOS, uh, yes, uh, they, have not, uh, they are not signatories to the UNCLOS. It is also basically because they are an objection to the IESA now controlling uh, areas which are beyond uh, national jurisdictions, you know, which are, if it is beyond, like those two areas that I showed you for uh, mineral exploration, you know, as to why should somebody else uh, come and uh, tell you as to what is the, you know, area of just allotted to you. How can somebody else have, uh, you know, authority over uh, areas which are outside was the, was the fear. Uh, so because, however, the US have also, you know, time and again said, and even in that time when they said no to signing it, have said that they will respect uh, whatever the conditionalities which is laid down. Uh, they don't accept this uh, uh, this this uh, clause which was put to say that uh, uh, we understand that you know military maneuvers will require prior. That's why they keep doing this phone uh, here and there. Uh, I don't think we should be too concerned about. It. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh... Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll come to that. I think uh, Admiral has uh, finished in such a way that we have enough time for questions. So there's one from Dr. Nitin Kulkarni. He's a senior fellow in the Forum for Integrated National Security. It's quite a well-regarded uh, think tank in Mumbai. Uh, so welcome, Dr. Nitin. Uh, he asks um, the esteemed speaker, considering the current geopolitical and economic scenario, the IOR region will be very volatile and turbulent for the next 25 years. Of course, it will be, which will affect our integrated national security. Uh, how will we as Bharat respond to such complex threat? So he's talking in general terms of uh, the future forecast for next 25 years. I'll combine that with what um, uh, my friend uh, Sanjeev Mandi, uh, uh, a naval officer, uh, uh, asked. So he's talking directly of the dragon in the room, so to say, that how do we, you also mentioned Maldives and all. So so uh, Commodore Mandi asks, how can we handle the threat of China uh, in these waters over the next few years? So so uh, uh, you are forecast for 25 years, uh, specifically the Chinese question and, and what should Bharat do in these circumstances? <laughs> I don't envy you. <laughs> no, uh, these are kind of valid questions, uh, though difficult to answer. But uh, uh, if I were to, uh, you know, talk about the uh, next twenty-five years, one of the things that has happened, uh, I mean, if you were to, if you were to look at the future, keeping in mind the immediate past, uh, I think the growth of India uh, as a nation, as a power, as a respected uh, entity, uh, is, is bound to. Uh, have this momentum going into the future as well. And uh, I am uh, reasonably sure we'll only get stronger uh, in the maritime domain. And there is this realization of the importance of maritime domain. I, I spoke about the uh, uh, Prime Minister's uh, vision of security and growth for all in the region. And also the UNSC uh, open discussion chaired by uh, the Honorable Prime Minister, uh, Prime Minister Modi. Uh, so, I mean, these are indications that uh, there is a clear, and even, uh, I mean, if I were to say, even the appointment of National Maritime Security Coordinator shows the importance that the government attaches to the uh, to the maritime domain. Uh, so this is one thing that uh, I think will continue. There will be problems. I mean, uh, no region is uh, without any problems. IOR, especially because the world economy is dependent on this. I mean, for, for, the, for the foreseeable future, Oil and natural gas will continue to fuel economies, uh, especially of the uh, of the uh, giants in the uh, Western Pacific uh, and beyond. So, as a result, you will find there will be certain amount of this this dependence uh, in the Indian Ocean region uh, will make the ISL passing through the Indian Ocean region uh, very very important. Uh, some of them will see that uh, as their Achilles' heels. Do everything to ensure. The safety and security is ensured uh, because of which you will see some uh, type of war uh, going on between nations, but that's fine. I think uh, uh, even uh, uh, the China question that was asked, and this is exactly what is going on. But all that we need to do as a country is to ensure that in our dealings with others, uh, keeping in mind this, this concept of security and growth for all in the region, is to tell them that, listen, 
we all are in it together. We either sail together or sink together. You know, so every non-traditional threat to maritime security, if we are there genuinely helping others also to fight them, uh, the countries do realize the importance. I mean, take the case of Maldives, for example. I mean, uh, when you when you are hearing this, you know, out India campaign and that and this and all. Recently, there was an incident of a death uh, of a of a child who could not be evacuated for medical treatment, and which showed the importance of presence of uh, uh, you know India there. And uh, last time when there was a similar incident, uh, number of years back, uh, the then uh, uh, president also had said this, that the ease of patrols which we are doing for them need not happen. There were drugs which are washing ashore on the coast of uh, Maldives, you know, because there was nobody to ensure uh, prevention of uh, uh, non-traditional threats to maritime security. So, the long and short of it, I think it is up to us to continue to do what we do genuinely. And our maritime neighbors will realize the importance of the relationship that they have with India and at the Indian maritime forces. Because uh, at the end of the day, we are here closer to them. Our reaction will always be faster. And our, our cultural connect is that much stronger. And the, the trust factor is that much higher. So I think looking into the future, uh, we need not be concerned by these little blips that will happen along the way. The, the long-term vision will always be a spoon. Uh, right, sir. From there, we go to institutional question now. I'm combining two questions. One which asks, what is the relationship of NMSC with NSA, military advisor, CDA, CNS, DG, ICG, and other officials? Basically, he or she wants to know uh, where do you fit into the institutional framework and what are the institutional gives and take? Uh, the other is a bit more interesting. It says, given that there is a continental view of security and FX security institutions are in continental India, uh, do you, I mean, how do you increase maritime security awareness? I think he or she is trying to suggest that, is there a problem of maritime security awareness in our uh, security institutions architecture itself? Uh, so would you like to take that on? Yeah, okay. The first question, institutionally, when the National Maritime Security Coordinator uh, came into being, uh, organizationally, I am at the National Security Council Secretariat reporting directly to the National Security Advisor. There is a, a direct linkage between all the other verticals of uh, uh, NSCS as well, along, as well as the Navy and the Coast Guard and the, the State Police and uh, everybody else. And as I said, the multi-agency maritime security group, which is a regular, uh, uh, you know, institutional arrangement that meets uh, periodically, uh, you know, addresses uh, everything that is required in so far as interagency coordination is concerned. Uh, that's one. So, uh, the second question: uh, the the continental mindset versus the maritime lack of maritime consciousness. So, one of the uh, tasks that we have taken on is also to enhance maritime consciousness. There are there are a number of things that. Uh, we have done, we continue to do, uh, is that one, uh, you know, this is, is, is one thing by which I uh, I hope to have increased maritime consciousness across, you know, many of you who have listened to me. Uh, similarly, uh, whether it is, you know, lectures at various places and so on and so forth. Next, we have, we have linked up with uh, a number of think tanks. We have linked up with a lot of universities, you know, to, to, to help enhance maritime, uh, maritime consciousness. Because there is a lack uh, of understanding of issues maritime uh, across the country. Uh, in fact, uh, Commodore Kesnur is also quite heavily involved. We have also uh, spoken uh, and introduced credit-based, uh, you know, into our system of education at, at various levels. Uh, we are also now trying to introduce into competitive examinations uh, a portion of, uh, you know, maritime uh, history and maritime Maritimity. Uh, so all that hopefully should end up addressing uh, maritime consciousness in the country. Uh, thanks a lot, sir. Uh, maritime consciousness and how we can do was the questions of many people being asked in terms of, you know, uh, their their uh, 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 their understanding of the situation. Uh, sir, I'll take the last set of questions and then we'll see if there are anything from some of the uh, dignitaries with us. Uh, I'll, I'll combine these two or three. 
uh, one is uh, from a gentleman called Mr. Mukesh, who who seeks to know in general terms how how are we prepared uh, for the future? Uh, are we sort of future ready, future proof uh, in terms of a whole lot of challenges we see at sea? But I want to combine that. It's it's not directly related, but I want to combine that uh, in the interest of time. Uh, there's a gentleman called Vivek Kohelo who is asking. Uh, do you see a role for coastal communities and fishing communities to participate in participatory monitoring of coastal zone as a tool for deterrence? Basically, he wants to know if we can have coastal communities as friends of the Navy at sea and shore. Uh, so, so one is coastal communities. And finally, if you can add 30 seconds, how can the arm army, the ordinary citizen, uh, contribute to enhancing India's uh, maritime uh, sort of uh, strength or maritime uh, maritimity or whichever way. So uh, a general question, how are we prepared for the next few years? Second, what can be the participatory measures of citizens, including fishing communities? Yeah, um, so the first one, uh, I wish to believe that we are prepared. <laughs> there are uh, uh, issues that uh, we need to address, uh, especially when it comes to, you know, multi-agency coordination, for example, uh, whether uh, we, we now have, I showed you the picture of the uh, Information Management and Analysis Center. The government of India has now uh, sanctioned a National Maritime Domain Awareness uh, Project and the NMDA, which will come into being uh, rather quickly, will, will ensure that uh, every other agency is participated in, in uh, uh, creating and distributing uh, maritime domain awareness uh, in uh, around us, around India. Uh, and so far as non-traditional threats to maritime security is concerned, uh, yes, uh, they will continue to change and they will continue to get more complex uh, because the bad guy is also watching us and doing things which, uh, you know, he thinks uh, he can he can find a loophole in in your preparedness. So if you look at say for example drone attacks thousands of miles away uh, from the shore uh, into a uh, to a merchant ship, uh, despite the fact that there are thirty thousand merchant ships at any given point in time uh, in the Indian Ocean, majority of them in the Arabian Sea. Uh, so that is one uh, step forward by the bad guy. So uh, so this the threat will keep evolving. It is up to us to ensure that we not just keep in step with him, but are, are uh, you know many steps uh, ahead of him. Uh, in so far as the the war and primary job of the navy is concerned, I am sure that is being well addressed uh, through through inductions, through not only asset induction but through technology, Atmanirbhar. It's all today uh, made in India, make in India, and uh, we now have the uh, national innovation and indigenization organization to look after uh, how to how to progress towards cutting edge technologies. Uh, in in war fighting, so I think it's a it's a great job being done by each one concerned, uh, and so we are well prepared. Second, when it comes to uh, coastal community, they have got a huge role to play, and let me tell you, they do a marvelous job at at, at this present time, uh, because uh, when twenty six eleven happened, one of the weaknesses that was found was that there was no communication between uh, you know them who are there as eyes and ears of uh, uh, of the nation when it came to coastal security and the uh, agency which were there to ensure uh, security. So, but now there are structures which are informal, which are formal. There are there are also like toll-free uh, numbers for them to call. There are regular meetings. The Navy and the Coast Guard mainly uh, conducts coastal community uh, interaction programs, you know, in which they are kind of uh, explained as to uh, uh, what they can do uh, for uh, for uh, coastal security and for security in general. And so there is willingness uh, on their part to be participative. Uh, so there is a big step uh, which has been taken in so far as involving coastal community, uh, especially with the fishermen community is concerned. And uh, they are truly the eyes and ears of coastal security today. So I think uh, that's happening. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you. I, would have I would have closed here but I have to take these uh, last set of questions because they are from cadets of Sainik School Bijapur. And I think we need to give a certain priority to the cadets from there who are asking. 
they are asking from the auditorium uh, i am combining both both questions again uh, the first one is uh, can maritime studies be introduced in sainik schools uh, uh, in the cbsc educational syllabus cadet spurti so it's a girl cadet and we must say hats off to her uh, she is asking this and there is another cadet raghavendra who is also saying sir many movies are based on army and air force but we hardly find any on our navy and uh, small exceptions like pony and selvan and gazi attack uh, what is your view on this what should we do uh, i think uh, these are two interesting questions from the cadets uh, you could answer that and uh, after that i will i will wrap up sir okay the first one yes i do uh, believe that there needs to be uh, you know a better percentage of maritime studies in the curriculum and there are measures which have been initiated to ensure that and uh, uh, so that that's being followed up and the, the moment cbsc the, whether it is any school or other schools uh, you know it, it applies i think uniformly so there is at least an effort to ensure that happens and i'm i'm i truly hope that it happens as quickly as possible uh, when it comes to movies uh, yeah that's a good question uh, of course pony and selvan was a super hit and uh, a good one we've got rich maritime history unfortunately not too well recorded uh, rajendra chola uh, you know going uh, all the way to uh, sri vijaya empire to sort them out because of this non traditional threats of uh, uh, you know uh, safety and security in the malacca straits uh, through which the trade between the fatimids of egypt the cholas of uh, south india and the and the song dynasty of uh, china was happening at that point in time uh, and uh, plus you know ex uh, uh, Lot of expeditions which went out for capture of Maldives and capture of Sri Lanka and so on and so forth. So we seem to uh, not make it. But when it comes to movie making, I suppose uh, uh, this was again. If you saw um, uh, Pony and Selvan again, was by and large a land based movie. You know there are there was very little of uh, navy. Uh, I suppose with uh, uh, there is a, there is a drive. There are a couple of movies which have been made. One of them is in uh, Malayalam. But that is something that I think I can. Uh, take it forward and you know talk to some directors to see if they'll be interested and make it possible for them to do it because uh, you know getting onto a warship and going itself it can be a challenge. In fact, there were some of the slides which I uh, kind of removed, assuming that uh, you know I might uh, kind of uh, go beyond the allocated time. Uh, but the fact is this that uh, you know one of the challenges of going out to sea is just the the uh, your ability to go to sea uh, because you will rock and roll. and uh, you know people feel would feel seasick and so on so all this uh, expensive uh, gadget that the movie makers would need to come and the heroes and the heroines whether they'll be uh, you know will they will not feel seasick uh, are all questions that one need to ask but uh, i suppose this is a very valid point uh thank you ever so much sir a uh, wonderful uh, way in which you handled all the questions the fact that we have so many still unanswered shows the enthusiasm for your talk and the curiosity and interest it engendered uh, what i have done sir uh, is i have uh, shared my email with everyone saying all unanswered questions will be sent to me and then i'll share it with you subsequently or with your staff so that in case any of them need to be answered uh, we will follow it up uh, thank you so much uh, i hand over back to the mc ranga uh, for taking the program forward ranga sorry for interruption ranga Yes, sir. Uh, Please go ahead, sir. Give me a minute uh, before we proceed with the next agenda. I would like to invite two of our seniors here, Colonel B. G. B. Kumar and Commodore Arvin Shigam, to share their observations and, uh, or if they would like to uh, ask any question, they are welcome. Sir, Colonel B. G. B. Kumar, sir, please come over. Admiral, it was uh, fantastic. exposure to the navy and probably the majority of the indians have not even seen a sea coast you know it is not a neglected uh, uh, frontier but uh, it was not uh, given much of an importance and uh, probably like let's say from the ajis probably arvind and uh, uh, purandar and uh, kesnur or one of those pioneers who went into the navy rest were all going into the army and the air force 
Uh, it's a mind-boggling subject and probably we need to hear you a couple of times moreover to see, you know, to explore into the, you see, a little more. The opportunities are, you know, vast and we are tiny dots on the sea. Actually, whatever ships and whatever strength we have, we are absolutely tiny. And I thank uh, Commodore Kasnur to have got you into this and enlightening us on this particular topic. And like, let's say in the army, long back when I was studying for the DSSE, I was reading on uh, Rommel's theory of fighting in the deserts. He was comparing it to the seas and the ships in the seas. And that's how we should, and we hardly knew as to what a sea is and what a ship is at that time. Anyway, it is something, it was a mind boggling subject and you, and I'm, you, uh, Admiral, you are something because if the government can think of putting you as a coordinator to put down this clutter of agencies and get on to some sort of a sense in this entire security of maritime, it is something unbelievable job. You have a very tough job ahead and I wish they give you adequate time in your life to see that you settle something out of this and as a food for thought for you, you should start writing something as to how we can dom ex dominate and exploit in future of these, this vast potential. You should put down in writing somewhere and you'll probably, uh, when you retire from this present post, you can do it, I suppose, or you can start thinking on it. But you have a really a thankless, unenvying job of putting down this clutter. I, I can imagine the clutter which has been created Ultimately, someone has thought that someone like you should be put in there to see that there is one agency which will handle all these things and coordinate it. Thank you very much. It was a great speech. Thank you, sir. Yeah, so uh, we invite Commodore Arvind Shigar to share his mind, please. Sir, he needs to unmute. Sir, yeah, I can unmute. mute, yeah. yeah. No, I think you are not unmuted. Uh, Arvind, please unmute. Yes. And now you look as if you are diving into the sea. <laughs> yeah. Right, I am unmuted. Now you are And Ashok, uh, that includes Ashok Dalwai as well as uh, Ashok Kumar. <laughs> All I would like to su su summarize is to say that no nation can ever be complacent. No nation can ever say that they are fully ready. They are as ready as the next threat or the skirmish that props up over the horizon. It's only then that I think there is some problem, technical yeah. snag. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah I mean, sorry. Something went off uh, on my screen. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Now perfect. Yeah. Now much perfect. So every nation or navy is as ready as the next flare up that takes place over the horizon. So it will be only fanciful to think that we can prophesy this. It's only when an event occurs that we start learning. And the process of learning is a continuum. Nonetheless, Ashok, I think you have created the kind of awareness that would enthuse the younger generation. And uh, you have all the wherewithal within you cerebrally to bring this into fruition in the course of your stint as the National Maritime Coordinator. Thanks for the expose, for the benefit of such a large audience. And uh, it's also a mission fulfilling for the AKF. Thanks, Ashok, and both the Ashoks. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Yeah, I think before we proceed, Rang, another interruption. Lieutenant Commander Vivekanand wanted to make a point. Uh, so, so, uh, good evening, sir. Good evening, uh, both Ashoks are again, Admiral, sir. So, it's not a question, but just information. When once I came to know that you are pursuing your PhD, 
I have already done my PhD in uh, uh, this ma marine industry only, sir. And uh, that is from IIT Mumbai. And my two more books will be coming on that. So I'll be touching you for those say, uh, same things, sir. If you don't mind, just sure. for information, sir. Thank sure. you, much, sir. Thanks. Thank you, Ashok, sir. Thank you. Yeah, yeah Ranga, you can proceed. Yeah, Ranga, proceed. Thank please. you so much, sir. Thank you so much. And uh, I, I wish uh, we had more time for Q and A because they were coming so thick and fast that it was hard to keep keep up with them. <laughs> but hopefully, we'll get uh, Admiral Ashok Kumar, sir, once again uh, in the near future and accommodate those questions and many more that we could not uh, take up today. Uh, I now invite uh, our mentor, Dr. Ashok Dalwai, sir. To say a few words, over to you, sir, Ashok, sir. Yeah, Ranga, thank you very much. And uh, you have been uh, one star along with uh, Commodore Case Noor. Uh, Admiral Ashok Kumar has been very kind enough to oblige our request to be with us this evening. Uh, Admiral, I must say that you have been one of the most punctilious speakers that we've had so far. Mm -hmm. So much to speak, so much to share, and yet you held yourself back. As they say that, why not hang the boots now before, why not? So you, I think our people wanted to ask many more things, wanted to share, wanted to hear. I must say that now you become a member of our family. So you are an alumnus of the Alumni Association. So you're welcome anytime and you don't need an invite. We all have really benefited immensely this evening. The question that that particular cadet asked about why no movies of Navy at par with that of police or the Indian Army or the Indian Air Force drives home the point that we have not paid as much attention to the security of our nation along the 11,000 kilometer length of coastline. We keep speaking about 3.29 million square kilometers of our landmass, forgetting that the 21st century is going to be the drama on the waters. So we must add 2.1 million square kilometers of water to the 3.29 million square kilometers of landmass and look at the three important concerns from the national perspective. One is, of course, the economic development, economic security flowing therefrom, the human security, and in the 21st century, wrought as we are from the climate change, what we need to do for adaptation and mitigation of climate change concerns of the water bodies. And fourth, of course, is the national security itself. The drama of national security, as you rightly said, is now not going to be so much along the territorial boundaries, but it is going to be along the coastline and around the islands. So today you have educated all of us about the complexities of maritime security. What do we mean by the maritime security? And it goes beyond the common perception of fighting a war or protecting ourselves from the external threats. It means much more economic and information technology-led warfares. I'm sure not just the young cadets, but all of us who have grown up also come to understand this evening what is maritime security, what is the concept, what are the challenges, what are the issues. And as far as India is concerned, whatever domain we pick up, the biggest casualty is coordination. And that's where I'm sure you two are facing a big challenge. The number of actors that you shared with us, it is an endless list and many more I'm sure will come to be added to that. So your domain of complexity is only bound to enhance further. But with your vast experience and expertise, I'm sure you would be able to standardize the protocols, institutionalize the mechanisms, 
and lay the foundation and the culture required for a long-term sustainable maritime security of our country. And I think all of us also must remember that India today is not just talking about itself. Having decolonized itself mentally, today India is talking of playing a bigger role on the global landscape. And one of the important challenges of any maritime security is to protect its ships both within and outside. And that you highlighted so much to our benefit. So we must thank you abundantly for having been kind enough to be with us and having shared the oceanic knowledge that you have in an average format. I'm sure you've kindled a lot of interest in both young and elderly minds to now start reading books, to listening to debates, to searching on the internet, to gain deeper insights. I would take this particular opportunity to share a bit about our own Ajit Alumni Association. Because this evening we have a large family of signing schools. We have a large members of the alumni associations of various signing schools. So we are in a way in a family get together this evening. And with such seniors like you from different signing schools, it becomes all the more easy for us to communicate in a very friendly manner. Alongside the signing schools from across the landscape of our country, we also have various other schools, colleges, and institutions who have joined us this evening. And for kind information of our Admiral, these are the schools and institutions who are a regular audience at every session of the AKM. So we have co-opted them as associate members of the Alumni Association. This evening, in fact, the Vice Chancellor of the Indian Maritime University, Chennai, was also supposed to join, who incidentally happens to be my batchmate. But she had another engagement, but she has asked her university faculty to join. I'm sure you're in touch with them at Chennai. Your name itself kindled a lot of interest across the board. So we must thank you for that also. And this evening when we shared the list of signing schools for the first time over the last two years, that our president of the AKF had an endless list to share with everyone. So taking advantage of the presence of various science schools, their principals, vice principals, and the senior alumni, including senior naval officers, army officers from our own school, science school, Bijapur, one of the visions of institutionalizing the Ajit Alumni Association has been to convert that into a constructive platform for engaging with one another, not just for social networking as generally happens, but to become more engaging members of the nation. And as a part of institutionalizing our own association, whose members, of course, are sprinkled across the globe, what the president of our association, Mr. Gopal Vasur, our mentor, Colonel B.G.B. Kumar and others, discussed among themselves and, our, and I would say a few more, that finally, can we have a federation of all the science school alumni for across the country? Can there be a national federation of the alumni of science schools? Maybe we would like to call it an NFASS, National Federation of Alumni Signing Schools, or National Alumni Federation of Signing Schools. We're all aware of international bodies like Rotary, Lions, Red Cross, all these organizations which are more than 100 years old now, started at a very small place, started just with two, three, four, five members, started with a very limited objective of getting together. But over a period of time, they expanded the horizon to become active, engaging members of the global landscape. So given the fact that the Honorable Prime Minister has announced 
expansion of the science school network from 36 that we had to 100. And also that fact that the girl cadets are now being allowed into the science schools and they'll grow up into the armed forces of our country. We will have lakhs and lakhs of alumni from different science schools over the next few years. We by now already have one and a half lakh alumni of different science schools beginning with 1962-63. It is therefore feasible for us to create a platform and become constructive members in the story of nation building. You're also aware that as a part of the National Education Policy 2020, there has been a great emphasis laid on utilizing the services of the alumni in nation building. In fact, all the universities, all the colleges across the disciplines have been asked to strengthen their alumni associations and take up different activities in their respective domains. And we are also aware how the alumni associations in Africa, in the United States have been playing a very active role. In fact, international development associations go consciously to build alumni association in Africa and get them into building various institutions like medical colleges and welfare institutions. So given your own national vision and national presence, and also given that we have a large number of alumni of different science schools here, we're at very senior positions, with permission of our own president and other seniors, Commodore Harvind Shigao, Colonel BGB Kumar and others, I would like to place before you that let's now get together and start stitching together the alumni of different science schools and see how over a period of time we can legalize that through a statute and become, as I said, constructive members in nation building. Uh, that we have principals and vice principals and other administrative personnel of different science schools. I would also like to humbly request all of them as to how they can start coordinating with one another to get all the cadets to join our Ajit Knowledge Forum, which meets every alternate month. I'm sure the cadets, though may not understand everything that the speakers may be sharing, but at least they get to and get a window of opening. So I would also request, therefore, the principals here to be part of our uh, team. So I won't take further time because it would only, it would only be uh, on my part a superfluous effort, uh, uh, ignorant as I am of the maritime security, or it would be uh, uh, becoming uh, putting up a, a false facade to show that I know something about that. So I thought, let me take this opportunity to share this particular thought of how we all can come together. And our own experience for the last two years of institutionalizing Ajit Alumni Association has borne a lot of results. And we are now on the, on the process forward. So thank you, Admiral. You are a picture of humility, humbleness. After Shrikant spoke to you and, and when I spoke with you and shared a mail, you, you spent not just a second to say yes to our invite. So thanks a lot. And it is you who said that you too belong to the Sine School. And we immediately opened up our hearts to each other. So this is what's going to happen when we speak to all the Sine Schools. So thank you very much once again. And I would also like to thank everybody present here uh, who has been kind enough to be uh, part of this evening gala uh, of this uh, talk. Thank you very much. Ranga, back to you. Thank you, Ashok Galvai, sir. I now request the president of Ajit Alumni Association, Sri Gopal Hussoor, to kindly address the gathering. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Ranga. You look as fit as ever. <laughs> thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, for the information of the chief guest, he is a marathoner, runs every day continuously, and he inspires us. <laughs> thank you, sir. Uh, let me also uh, thank. Uh, uh, Admiral uh, uh, Commodore Srikanth for having uh, got us such an outstanding speaker, the one who is a part of our own family, who is from the Sine School. The first speaker, incidentally, sir, was from Sine School. 
He was the Captain Gopinath, the founder of the Air Deccan. But before I speak, let me give you all a good breaking news. The good breaking news is Rohan Bopanna has won the Australian Doubles Open along with Matthew uh, Abder. So I think he deserves a great congratulations for, from all the tennis lovers. I do not know whether our chief guest loves tennis, but I am sure he loves the victory today. Uh, sir, you have been an outstanding uh, speaker today and uh, you have actually opened up a lot of things for us to think, deliberate upon. I have a small connect, uh, probably with a very small connect, though uh, many of my school friends are also from the Indian Navy who have held some good positions and all that. Incidentally, my son is also a naval officer. He gave up a lucrative private sector job in an engineer and decided to join the Indian Navy. My he, failed, uh, he failed in the first <laughs> SFB, but uh, he continued. And the uh, image that you showed of monitoring the ships on the Indian Ocean region, the 30,000 ships, one day he said, Appa, I cannot talk to you much on this, but I'm doing that job at the DNCO. Or I think, I don't know whether if I'm right. That's right. So That's right. it is something uh, I connect with you. And the other factor is that you mentioned about the coastal security. As an you know, Inspector General of the Western Range, I had around 320 kilometers of coastline uh, in my jurisdiction. And many challenges that the local police, uh, in fact, how they fail and why they fail, and the need for coordination. I was reading the 9-11 report of the attack on the U.S. And one of the important factors that was found by the commission was lack of coordination between multiple agencies in the United States. And I'm so happy that today the government has decided that we must have somebody at the apex level. And I think nobody could have been better than you to head that, to coordinate the various uh, the facets, various uh, uh, verticals of the uh, our maritime security. Today, you have Ajits across the globe listening to you. It's not just a few of us here. Probably you are not seeing their images. Uh, a huge number of Ajits across the seas and the oceans are, have listened to you. And uh, it's such a uh, happy occasion for us that we heard somebody speak about the subject in an extremely professional manner with the presentation so that we could immediately, our imagination could be attracted to the various uh, nuances of maritime security, the challenges and the strategies. Dear Ajits, across the globe, we have our principal, uh, Madam Pratibha Bhist with us. Uh, to the chief guest and to all of you, I must say, that the Nari Shakti is being displayed in our Sainis school Bijapur today. After she has taken charge of the Sainis school, a large number of activities she has undertaken. The alumna is extremely happy with her performance or we are nobody to judge her performance, but we get a lot of feedback on the activities that she has taken up in the school premises, the infrastructure development, I think as and when you get an opportunity, I would request our chief guest to visit Sainis School Bijapur and to have a look at our war museum. Incidentally, I was there a couple of, uh, uh, maybe about a couple of weeks back and visited the school along with the team from the, a very important sector which I touched upon is the natural gas. A team from uh, Delhi had come and I took them to visit the Sainis School to discuss with, uh, to show them my alma mater, and they were so proud that uh, uh, a school is doing so well. One suggestion, incidentally, they gave was that the school has a vast area. Whether could we increase the activities in the school by inducting the strength of the school or something more? I think it is for our principal to uh, examine that, and it, of course, it's a policy matter uh, for all of us to think. Sir, you have provided a great insight 
into this subject of maritime security. And nobody really understands, like somebody was mentioning, the armies is, of course, they are uh, doing a fantastic job uh, guarding our borders. But maritime security is so complex and uh, it is uh, so vast. It is very difficult to imagine. And after listening to you, we could get, I think, some, I'm sure you would have done a lot of things from us. You could not have uh, told us in the public domain, but I can uh, realize that there are a lot of much more complex things that the maritime security involves, which cannot be publicly discussed. Uh, I think uh, as uh, alumni of a school which has built in us the strength and character to do well in life, in whatever walk of life we are in, Many, most of many of them, the primary objective of the school is to join the NDA. Those who did not join the NDA have got into the civilian life. They have been civil servants, they have been engineers, they have been doctors, they have been agriculturists, they have been politicians. You name the field, most of the alumni are in those fields. And the best part is that the school laid such a strong foundation for each one of us that we have tried to do whatever best was possible and far better from the humble backgrounds that we came into join the school. I think the school gave us a wonderful platform to progress in life and contribute whatever bit we could to the nation building. I think national security is an extremely important subject and I am sure the alumni of the Saini school will be more conscious of it being uh, uh, in at a Chinese school to understand how this nation can go forward in the years to come, how a collective effort of the alumni, as Ashok Wright uh, beautifully brought it out, having a uh, federation of the Chinese school alumni uh, in a big, larger context and uh, ensure that we all work together, we become a very, very strong think tank or an organization which can actually provide a lot of support to the nation building. Uh, having said this, I must also mention that uh, 2024, yours has been the first talk. We have had distinguished speakers earlier. I think we have begun uh, Ashok and uh, all the organizers, uh, Sudarshan Satija, uh, compliments to you, you guys for having brought a wonderful speaker, I think, this is a very, very good beginning for the AKF and for the AAA. A large number of players in Belgaum today playing golf and they have joined despite the hectic game of golf today. The Ajit alumni organizes an annual golf championship. So I had requested them and a large number, even in fact, Commodore Shigang who is there and uh, Raghu who is there, my uh, Rear Admiral Raghu, they were all joined from Belgaum from distant places. So I think the interest that you have uh, brought into us will go a long way to build not just awareness about maritime security, but a bondage that uh, we all have amongst ourselves. I'm sure your uh, school also must be having a very strong alumni uh, uh, today. So we look forward to more interactions with you and uh, uh, probably in the years to come, let us leverage this forum to share our experiences, our insights and expertise in creating a reservoir of a collective knowledge that benefits all of us. So I will uh, request the AKF uh, in which uh, my dear friend Ashok Dalvai has taken a lot of lead in organizing such programs that we should have more and more programs like this get more and more speakers to us, enrich our uh, horizons of knowledge and uh, so that we should be able to contribute much better. Though I think I have retired 10 years back, but I still have that enthusiasm as an youngster that I should do something more than what I'm doing now. Such talks will definitely help us to uh, strengthen our resolve uh, to do something for the nation for, from which we have been benefited so much. So saying these few words, I'd like to thank uh, all those who have worked to make this program a great, uh, great success. Uh, Srikanth, of course, 
a good friend and a historian, naval historian today. Uh, then Prakash Saigavi, then uh, Ashok, of course, Ranga, Arvind Pradhani. There are a lot of people who have worked behind the scenes who have not appeared on the screen. So I would like to thank as the president of the AAA, all the best. Uh, thank you for all the efforts that you have put in for organizing this program and let us all work together. Sir, thank you once again and thank you all. Jai Hind. Our school motto is Ajit hai, Abhit hai. I do not know what is your school uh, <laughs> motto. Can do uh, it. Huh? I Can do it. Achha, okay. Can thank do you. It. Thank you one and all for this wonderful opportunity. Uh, let us work together. In a couple of uh, weeks, I think Ashok Darwai's team has worked out the bylaws for the uh, Alumni Association, the new bylaws, and I'm sure within the next uh, five to eight weeks, we should be able to roll out a new bylaw and uh, be better structured for uh, the days to come. Thank you and Namaskar. Thank you for your thoughts and summary, Gopal Hasur, sir. And thank you for the kind words. Uh, we are almost at the home stretch now. Um, but it's a tough act to follow the luminaries that have spoken before me. I'll try my best uh, to deliver the vote of thanks as best as I can. I hope uh, you all have enjoyed the extremely enlightening and motivating session with Vice Admiral G. Ashok Kumar as part of the ongoing initiative by the Ajit Knowledge Forum of the Ajit Alumni Association. It is my honor and privilege to propose a vote of thanks to all those who helped make this event happen. Vice Admiral G. Ashok Kumar, Ajit's principal and staff of Sainik School Bijapur, principals and administrative staff of the various schools and colleges that have graced the event, distinguished guests, and those present here with us today. Warm greetings once again. Admiral Ashok, sir, thank you for sharing your insights on the challenges, threats, and opportunities that our coastline presents and inspiring us to take the challenges head on and showing us how and why it is important to safeguard ourselves. You have truly enlightened us today with your experience and knowledge. Many thanks once again for taking the time to speak with us despite your very busy professional and personal schedule. I would like to thank Thank School Bijapur for giving us the opportunity to gather here today as alumni and students. Our sincere thanks to the principals, administrators and students at the various schools and colleges who took the time to attend the event. Our sincere and heartfelt gratitude to our senior Ajits, our mentor Ashok Dalvai and president of AAA Gopal Hosur for inspiring us to reach for the stars and helping us realize our potential and work as a team. Thank you both for both Sorry. Thank you both for so wonderfully summarizing the talk by Admiral Ashok. The event has also benefited tremendously from the valuable inputs from our advisor, Ajit Tashidhar Albur, and observer, Ajit Vishwanath Patel. We would also like to take a moment to acknowledge the guidance and support of Ajit Colonel BGV Kumar in the conduct of AKF events in particular and AAA in general. Our sincere thanks to all the senior Ajits who have been a forceful guiding light for all of us. Please indulge me as I take a moment to acknowledge the contributions of Ajits in bringing this event to life. Ajit Prakash Saigavi, thank you for kickstarting the proceedings this evening. Commodore Srikant Kesnur for the wonderful introduction to the guest of honor this evening, Vice Admiral G. Ashok Kumar. Commodore Srikant Kesnur again, thank you for beautifully anchoring the very insightful Q&A session with Admiral Ashok. A big shout out to all the team members and volunteers under the leadership of Sudarshan Satija, Chairperson AKF, and Prakash Saigavi, who is standing in today on behalf of the Chairperson, for working tirelessly and selflessly in conceptualizing and bringing this event to us. Thanks also to the team members and volunteers under the guidance of Ajit Shivprasad Khenad for having done a stellar job as part of the media committee. They say it takes a village to raise a family. Ajits around the world are no less than a family. I would like to take a moment to acknowledge and recognize all the Ajits who have worked 
tirelessly as a family in making this event a possibility. Senior Rajits, Maltesh Jeevannavar, Sidram Nadagoda for their presence and guidance in planning and executing the event. Commander Dr. Vivekanand Bankoli for working through the event promotion logistics and for inviting and ensuring the participation of various schools and colleges. Commodore Srikanth Kesnur for widening the net and making it possible for a much larger and wider set of participation from the various Sainik schools and the services. Amok Bailal and Vijay Thakur for the wonderful creatives and patiently working through the feedback and comments during the design and development phase. Milind Katti and Arvind Pradhani for ensuring a seamless technical experience. Akshay Patel for distributing the event content on social media. A big round of applause to each and every one. Any omissions in acknowledging the contribution of Ajits or others in the conduct of the event is completely unintentional and the error is solely mine. Thank you everyone once again for being here. With your presence and your interactivity, you have made it a very memorable and special event. Before we conclude, as a fitting finale to the event, we will play an instrumental version of the national anthem. You are encouraged to voice out the national anthem if you wish to, along with the tune. In case of any unforeseen glitches while playing the national anthem, we request you to sing the national anthem at the regular pitch, tone and pace. May I now request you all to rise for the national anthem. Thank you and wish you all a pleasant rest of the day and greetings once again on India's 75th Republic Day. <laughs> 